Well, good morning. Good morning here at Grace Life Church. We're excited and thrilled. This is the day the Bible says what the Lord hath made, and I shall be not sad, but what? Glad. glad. How many how many gladders do we have? That's not glad. if you looked that up for the in the if you look up gladders in the uh, dictionary, you won't find it. Maybe gladiator, but we're we're glad. We're not sad. And uh, this morning, it's a privilege uh, for my wife and I, Michelle and I, to have uh, some dear friends of ours uh, going to come minister this morning. Uh, Dr. Ferris, Bill Ferris, pastored for 40 years plus. 40 what? 47 years. Now, I'm not even that old yet. Well, maybe close to it. I don't know, somewhere in there. And pastored for 47 years. Can you imagine that? Standing in the pulpit for 47 years and preaching the gospel. 47 years. And then also traveled as uh, a missionary evangelist into other countries and evangelized. So, uh, <clears throat> but he was here a few weeks ago and he received the offering for us and began to share some things with us in, uh, in a measure. And I, I just asked him would he come back and kind of do that again and give him time. Uh, to elaborate a little bit more on, on what he has, because he's um, he has a he has a he has a kingdom purpose. He has a kingdom heart, and, and he loves the church, but he sees the world, and that's what we're interested in. We're in, we're interested in kingdom in the entire world, aren't we? Amen. So, uh, Dr. Bill Ferris will be speaking this morning. So, if y'all would give him a big hand as he comes. Amen. God bless you, sir. I don't know what's been happening the last several weeks here at Grace Life in the area of worship, but something fresh is happening during our time of worship. The selection of the worship songs today was perfect. And Hearing that old hymn as our last worship song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, just touches me. I have so much to thank and be grateful for. But most of all, that God's grace just keeps reaching out and touching me even when I don't deserve it. And that's why it's called grace. And that's why it's so amazing. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and to be with your congregation. Pastors Eric and Michelle, this, I'm just so blessed. And to have the Billings with us all the way from Key West, Florida, <laughs> means more to me than, than you realize. And I'm sure they'll make their way to Tuscaloosa today, but they stopped here in Jemison, Alabama to worship and this just touches me when you put something on the shelf is that permanent if you have an object that you place on the shelf is it going to be there forever or can you take it back down can you take that object off the shelf but you can put it back but have you ever felt like you were on the shelf? Well, I have. As Pastor Eric was sharing with you, I pastored a long time and I've preached in a lot of countries and that's been God's choosing, God's design. All I did was 50 years ago say yes. That's all I did. I said, yes, I will preach your gospel. 
And the Lord opened the door. And I can honestly say that it has been, as Jerry Savelle once said, an adventure of faith and an adventure in faith. And faith has been such a part of everything that has transpired in our lives uh, in those 50 years. But I have felt like for the past eight years that I've been on the shelf when it comes to preaching and teaching. The last preaching that I did was in 2013. And from that time until a year and a half ago, I was a hospice chaplain. And that's a different type of ministry. It's needed, but you don't preach. If you're a, if you're a hospice chaplain, you companion those that are dying. So I companion those that were dying. I walked with them on their path, on their journey, not just with the patient, but with their caregivers, their family. And when God allowed it, I got really close to so many of these people, even here in Chilton County, Alabama. Very, very close. I know every back road in Chilton County. I know shortcuts when the interstate is backed up. If I can get off the interstate, I know how to get somewhere in Chilton County because I know the country roads and I know the people that lived in those homes on those country roads as well as here in town. But I didn't preach. I did a lot of funerals. I officiated funerals, but I haven't been in the pulpit for eight years until this morning. I'm not going to preach, I'm going to preach and teach. This is a hybrid. It's a little bit of both, but you will hear the preacher's heart as I'm seeing something in my spirit that's already begun, but it's going to get so great that we're either going to have to buckle our seat belts and hold on or just forget it. What I'm talking about is that great awakening that We've heard about all our lives, those of us that have been a part of the, the people of God, the church, we, we've been hearing about the great awakening that's going to come to America, but not just to our country, but for those of you that are listening in nations around the world, this awakening has begun everywhere. Amen. And the glory of the Lord is being poured out as the waters cover the sea. And do you know there's more water on this planet than there is dry ground? That's amazing to me. And on the dry ground in nations are people that are still waiting to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom that we sometimes take for granted, and they're just waiting for somebody to tell them. And because we have electronics and media, we are able to go everywhere and take this good news, this gospel of the kingdom everywhere. My wife and I have been watching uh, this new series called The Chosen. I heard about it, but I never really tuned in until last week. 
And it is impacting us in a very powerful way. The chosen. Just watching the actor that plays the part of Jesus interacting with his disciples and the way he talks and heals the sick and moves through the crowd and how he teaches the kingdom. Everywhere he goes, the kingdom expands. Jesus was a part of an awakening 2,000 years ago. But the ripple effect is now becoming a tsunami. And it is moving. And you can't stop it. And many prophets, uh, people like Bob Jones, and uh, they've gone to be with the Lord, and T.L. Osborne, and... Dr. Kenneth Hagan and Dr. Oral Roberts, and I could just go on and on. They've already gone to their heavenly reward. But they talked about this awakening and that there would be one billion souls come into the kingdom. <laughs> That's a lot of people. One, think about it. One billion people. And I, I'm just so excited that we are a part of reaching a segment of that one billion in Liberia. It is just one part of this great awakening to be able to make a personal investment in a pastor as you both do on a daily basis with him as you impart what you learned and what you've been taught by God through the years and then give to this pastor, Sundagar, and he just soaks it up like a dry sponge soaks up the water and he believes you and he acts on it and that's what faith is all about it's hearing the word and then acting on it hearing it and then doing it and that's the great part of hearing the kingdom truths we have the opportunity to make a difference in one part of this world, Liberia, West Africa, to invest in a pastor and his congregation. And if you are listening, Pastor Sundagar, you will pastor many congregations. For there will be a spreading out of that congregation, that Grace Life congregation. And there will be multiple locations. And you will go in person and you will preach and teach. But then it will be so great that you will not be able to go personally every place and you'll be sending out those that represent the congregation, those that you trust, those that you have poured into. But then you will use the media. You'll use short circuit television and radio and short wave, I should say, short circuit. It's not going to be short-circuited. It's, it's going to be a wave. And you will use uh, media to reach these people, not just in Liberia, but in the surrounding nations. Uh, this, this is bigger than you realize. This is part of the one billion souls that are coming into the kingdom. And it's not that... 
I'm going to discount the importance of church. The church is very important. But sometimes we talk so much about church that we miss the bigger picture. And that's the kingdom. The kingdom of God, which is, the, the, it's almost, it's very difficult to explain it. The church is the body of Christ, but the kingdom also includes the church and much, much more. And so don't limit yourself to our church language. Because the billion that we're reaching, they don't know that language. They don't know our expressions. They don't know our terms. But they recognize power when it is in their midst. They recognize the anointing when it comes. They recognize that this Jesus that we talk about and preach and teach is not just a person that lived long ago, but he is alive today. So I want to share with you a teaching, preaching message about treasures in heaven. Our subtitle could be Seed for the Sower. Treasures in heaven, seed for the sower. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 20, hear the words of Jesus when He said, Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. I have been thinking so much the last two months about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, also the kingdom known, the kingdom of God. I've been thinking about it, I've been meditating on scriptures about the kingdom, and one day when I was preparing a plot of ground to plant my first garden, in 50 years. I had one 50 years ago and now I'm planning my second one. When I was uh, working preparing that plot of ground from scratch, I don't have a rototiller, I don't have a plow, but I've got a shovel and a pick and a wheelbarrow and, and, I, and I got it ready. And I kept thinking about the principles of the kingdom and how Jesus taught so much about sowing seeds. So I bought a greenhouse at Lowe's and believe it or not, I put it together. It took me several weeks. And I built a greenhouse and after I finished even though the weather was still cold, I started planting seeds in little pots, little starter pots, there in the greenhouse. And within eight days of planting those seeds, I saw those seeds starting to sprout. And sometimes, the temperature inside that greenhouse was 100 degrees in the winter. In the winter time. And I'm telling you, those little plants, especially those tomato plants, they really liked it. And every day, a couple of times, morning, middle of the day, just before dark, I go out to my greenhouse and make sure they've got plenty of water. And I collect rainwater. And I use rainwater to water them. And this uh, is exciting to me because I'm seeing the scripture come alive through my garden. Now I'm almost 72 years of age. 
And I know that I'm either going to go up to be with the Lord when He comes, or I'm going to go to heaven through what we call death. I mean, I just know it. Uh, I mean, I know it's going to happen one of those two ways. I could live to be a hundred or more. I just tickled that I'm 72 almost. I mean, I really am. Because if you knew what I experienced February a year ago, you would be grateful also. But I won't go into great detail about that, but just to say that a very strong, healthy guy suddenly was going down quickly. My, my strength, my stamina was leaving me. I didn't know what was wrong, and I had a heart disease that I inherited. Now, everything is under the blood as far as I'm concerned, and, and, I, and I didn't know that my mother's side of the family had this heart issue. And the cardiologist said that the reason that it never affected you until now was because the disease was causing your heart to get hard, like a rock and it was getting larger on that side of the heart. And he said, it was there when you were a little boy. It just wasn't very large, and it just got bigger and bigger, and it was cutting off the blood going to my brain and to my lungs, and, and I couldn't understand why I was so weak. And so I had open heart surgery, and they cut away that stone, that part of my heart that was just a rock. They just cut it out and did two bypasses and repaired a valve and put me back together. And I started recovering immediately. And I promise you I'm not making this up. I don't even have the scar where they opened me. That's how, that's how marvelous God restored me. And I knew then, because the Lord spoke to my spirit the night before the surgery. I wasn't scared. I wasn't afraid. I just didn't know what it was going to be like. I'd never had surgery. So I didn't know. And he said, I'm going to take that heart of stone away and I'm going to give you a new heart and when the surgeon came into my room to talk to me following the surgery the following day he said you have a new heart and I believe you will live a very long life and I believe that I mean I am, I am a worker I love to work but I love more working in the kingdom. But I learned so much from working. I, I learned so much from working. Uh, I know what it's like to live from paycheck to paycheck. I, I know what it's like to fight the traffic on Interstate 65 South and North every day, every day, every day. I know what it's like to work 14 to 16 hours every day. I'm not making that up. I not only drove 800 miles a week, but I would work till 10 and 11 at night and sometimes midnight just documenting the visits that were made that day, not to even mention the one-on-one -on -one with those patients. It was a very demanding job. So I know, I know what it's like to work. I'm not a body man. I don't have a, an auto shop. I'm not a mechanic. I, I, I don't know what it's like to do those things, but I know what to do when it comes to my call. but I love the kingdom more. 
I love working in the kingdom. And since the cardiologist says that I have a new heart, then I've told the Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And I believe that the Lord is taking me off the shelf. I really am happy about getting off the shelf. I, I don't like that shelf. I mean, I eat and breathe and live to share the gospel. I mean, I just love to share. I like it one-on-one. -on -one. I like it to crowds. I, I, I like it in a congregation. I just want to share good news. Now, this scripture, Matthew 6, verse 20, in the Passion, uh, it, it, you won't be able to see it on the screen, but just listen to it. Instead, stockpile heavenly treasures for yourselves that cannot be stolen and will never rust, decay, or lose their value. Instead, stockpile. Now, stockpile can be a noun, like I've got a stockpile of food in a closet, or I've got a stockpile of clothes. That's a noun. Or it can be a verb, and in this case, it's a verb. Stockpile, instead, heavenly treasures. So I see us putting, you know, stockpiling treasures in heaven, and Jesus said they won't rust there, they won't decay there, and they won't lose their value. The voice, translation says, instead... Put up your treasures in heaven where moths do not attack, where rust does not corrode, and where thieves are barred at the door. <laughs> I knew you would love that. Can you just picture that? The thief comes to steal what you've stored up, what you've stockpiled, and Jesus says they're barred at the door. The angels protect the interest, they cannot destroy and steal your treasures. The word stockpile means to accumulate for future use. Now keep that in mind. To accumulate for future use. What you store in heaven, your treasures in heaven, is going to be used by you for future use. Matthew 6, the next verse, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's obvious, isn't it? The message says. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Do you mean that if we store up treasures in heaven that that's where we most want to be and where we'll end up being. Yeah, that's what, that's what it means. The Passion says, For your heart will always pursue what you esteem as your treasure. Wow, what do you esteem? Then wherever your treasure is, that is where your heart will esteem and consider very important. The New Living Translation says, Wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will also be. Now that was an eye-opener for me. Now I love Mark Hankins. I love to hear him teach and preach. I'm telling you, that guy can just pour out. I very seldom see him even look down at any type of notes. I mean, he just pours out. And uh, it tickles me when he, when he says, uh, let's laugh about it. Let's laugh about it. <laughs> I never forget the time that the four of us went out to El Dorado, Arkansas. And we went to the conference that 
that Brother Buzzy Sutherland had, and Mark Hankins was one of the speakers. I mean, how blessed were we? And do you notice that Brother Buzzy, who also came to Chilton County, y'all brought him, Brother Buzzy and Mark Hankins, as well as many others, often use different versions or translations of a scripture. And when you hear it in the King James Version and then you hear it from other translations, you get different aspects of that truth. It's like the facets of a diamond. You just see the different facets. And this verse 21 says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Now, I remember hearing in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalm, that it says, Delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He will give you, He shall give you the desires of your heart. And Matthew 6, 21 said, For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So if you desire, delight yourself also in the Lord, if you find out what makes God happy, what gives God joy, and you delight yourself in that, then He'll give you the desires of your heart. Now listen to the voice on that same scripture. This is powerful. Take great joy in the eternal. His gifts are coming and they are all your heart's desires. <laughs> Take great joy in the eternal. Now we've been talking about heaven. Heaven is eternal, isn't it? God is eternal. God's in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, Jesus said, will not pass away. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth, but the heaven is eternal. What we, we know will pass away, but what God is going to do in the future, is it, it's, it's always going to be. If we take joy in that eternal, then His gifts are coming. And I mark my word, His gifts are coming to you if you take great joy in what God loves. Luke 15, verse 7. I tell you in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Catch it? Did you catch it? I, will, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven. Joy in heaven? There will be more joy in heaven? How, how, how do you get more? There will be more joy in heaven when one sinner repents. When one sinner, well, can you imagine what heaven will be doing when one billion <laughs> repent? I, I'm talking about another billion. We don't even know how many are already there. We don't know. Think about it. So every time someone repents and turns from their sin and turns to Jesus, there's joy in heaven. So winning souls equals joy in heaven. Souls equals treasure in heaven. Investing in souls equals treasure in heaven. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. His gifts are coming and they are all your heart's desire. The heart desire of God is to fill heaven with souls. Precious souls. Now, people ask me, 
does a pet, does an animal have a soul? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I know they got spirits. I, I think they, if you've got a pet that understands your language and understands you, you can tell whether they are getting it or not. But I'm looking forward to seeing some of my former pets here on earth again. I mean, heaven would be that, would be part of that. I mean, I would love to see them. <laughs> I had one named Cleopatra. Oh, I want to see her again. And I can just, and I, I, this is just me talking because I don't have Bible for this. But I believe Cleopatra will talk through me in English <laughs> or or whatever language we use in heaven. I, I, th I don't think she'll be meowing. I think she'll just be talking to me and say, do you remember the time that, that I did this and you got so upset with me? And you, I say, yeah, I remember. <laughs> and Cleo Cleopatra said, I thought you was going to kill me. I said, I wanted to. You really upset me that day. But I love you and I knew you were just a cat. When cats do, they're crazy. <laughs> they, <laughs> I love dogs, too. <laughs> I had some good dogs. Poochie. Prissy. <laughs> Mickey. <laughs> Skunky. I had some dogs, I'm telling you, in my life. Well, I would love to see them again. I I don't think they have a soul that can be saved, but I know human beings have a soul. We have a mind. We have a will. We have emotions. The Bible talks about Jesus came to save souls. So Humans have souls. And when one of those souls turns and starts following Jesus, then there's joy in that experience. Now, when we delight ourselves in seeing more souls added to heaven, then something great's about, I'm telling you, something's going to happen in your life, personally. Proverbs 30, verse 11 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. The seeds of good deeds become a tree of life. A wise person wins friends, the New Living Translation. Passion, but a life lived loving God bears lasting fruit, for the one who is truly wise wins souls. Now, listen to the Amplified. But this is, oh man, this, this is powerful. The fruit of the uncompromisingly righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise captures human lives for God as a fisher of men. He gathers and receives them for eternity. Wow! Now that, that is amplified. He, he, he wants us to be fishers of men because He gathers and receives them for eternity. Seeds produce fruit. John 15, verse 16, You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. I have set you apart for the work of bringing in fruit. Your fruit should last, and whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give it to you. The New Living Version. You didn't choose me, remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, Whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, He gives you the message. 
Now, get a hold of this. Seeds produce fruit, whether you plant squash seed, apple seeds, peach seeds, whatever seed you plant, it's going to produce that type of plant. Whatever seed you plant will produce that type. Jesus is calling us and has chosen us to be fruit bearers. In heaven, our treasure does not spoil. You remember at the beginning of this teaching, it says, uh, lay up treasure, store up treasures in heaven where it won't spoil and where thieves are barred at the door. Moths can't get to it. You sold peaches as a boy. Did you ever have a peach to go bad occasionally? Could you sell it for the same price as the good peaches? I mean, did you hide it under the good ones? <laughs> Sometimes that has happened to me. That has happened to me at this little market. That's why I've got my own garden now because I, I used to buy tomatoes at a little market in Bessemer and, and sometimes they would have a bad tomato down in the bottom under that I didn't see. But you, when, when fruit spoils, it loses its value and you can't get the same amount for it that you would good fruit. Heaven's fruit never loses its value. It never spoils. <laughs> so whatever you lay up in heaven, it, 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 it's going to be it's going to be all right. It's not going to spoil, and it's not going to lose its value. As a matter of fact, its value continues to increase. Before you can bring fruit, before you can bring in fruit, you've got to first plant a seed. When we want to win someone to the Lord. We have to invest first in their lives as a person, not as a statistic. Now, the Lord's been good to my wife and I. We, we, we ministered the gospel behind the Iron Curtain when it was still communist in Eastern Europe. And I'm just giving the Lord glory in Poland, we saw thousands come to Christ. Thousands. I'm not exaggerating. In Zambia, I have seen thousands repent and come to the Lord. The power of the gospel. But I could say to you today, I'm a great evangelist. I'm like Reinhard Bonnke. <laughs> thousands, thousands, thousands. I, mean, I, 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 I could do that. I just gave you that as an illustration, as an example. But I don't talk about people's souls as a statistic. When I think of those thousands, I still remember seeing their faces as individuals not as a number, not so I could put it in my newsletter. We had 4,000 conversions this week. No, it's not a statistic. When we want to win someone to the Lord, we first give ourselves to them. We invest in them. We, we find out what interests them. We attempt to earn their confidence and their trust. I was at a mall, Western Hills Mall, years ago, and um, I was a young, young Christian. I'd been a Christian about five years. And this young man came up to me, and I knew as he approached me that he was going to witness to me with the four spiritual laws. And sure enough, that's what came out of his pocket, a little track 
it had four spiritual laws, and the laws are good. I mean, the material, it was dynamic. Campus Crusade for Christ. It was, it was very good. But he came up to me. He didn't say, hello, my name is John Brown, and your name is... Uh -uh. He immediately started reading from the little track. And he said, do you know that you're a sinner and that there's a great gulf between you and God? I said, I sure do know I am. And I just kind of, being facetious, I just went along with him. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he got to the fourth part and then he was going to pray the sinner's prayer. And he said, would you like to pray with me now? I said, no. He said, you don't want to pray this? I said, no. I said, you don't care about me. I know your heart is right. I know that your motive is pure. I know that you feel that this is what God wants you to do. But I'm already a believer. I really do believe in Jesus. I, 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 I know I'm being kind of ugly to you, but I wish you'd have kind of even just asked my name before you started reading to me. I wish you'd have just shown a little interest in me as a person first. But I know that your heart is right. And I don't want to discourage you. All I want to do is encourage you. Before you share these beautiful truths with somebody else, spend some time with them. Invest yourself into their lives. You know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's the truth. And that's why missionaries make a difference is they live with the people that they're trying to reach. They sacrifice for those people. They get to know those people's language. They care first for the people then the impact makes a difference. I know Terry Law, who started with uh, Larry Dalton, Living Sound, that's the group that Laura and I were a part of, the ministry behind the Iron Curtain. And Terry Law, following his wife's death, and when Living Sound had no longer continued, it had been 25 years, uh, he felt that God was leading him in a different type of ministry and it was more mission, uh, hands-on, and he said, even though I love to preach as an evangelist, when I got to Afghanistan 20 years ago, when I got there 20 years ago, the people didn't want to hear what I had to say. They were hungry. And so he started a ministry called World Compassion, and he fed the hungry. He does what you've done, Matt. Uh, he provided what the people needed. They needed medical supplies, he provided. He, they needed blankets, he provided. Whatever they needed, he provided. He dug wells, he did whatever they needed. And when he did share the gospel of the kingdom, they received it. That's what I'm talking about. When we invest in souls, that's treasure in heaven. When we support missionaries, we enable them to do what they've been called to do. But here's the beautiful thing. We, too, share in the winning of souls through our giving. I mean, uh, I haven't been...
to a, another country to preach and teach for years now. It's been eight years. So I, I don't get to do that, but I can sure give. And one day when I was planting my garden, taking those little seeds that I had nurtured in the greenhouse and putting them in the ground, I said, Lord, I, I'll go if you want me to. I mean, I will. If you open the door, I'll go back in person. But I, I just want to give. And, and I've, I've been giving about $100 a month to a missionary for several years. But I said, I just want to do something more. I want to give. I mean, I want to give $1,000 a month. And I, th that was the figure the Lord gave me. I want to give $1,000 a month from now on. And I even want it to increase to $10,000 a month. I want to do that because I want to be a part of investing in souls on the mission field. I want to be a part of that. Now, just as I planted seeds for my garden, there are financial seeds. There's silver, there's gold, there's paper money, but there's also a different type of seed, financial seed. It's, it's called crypto currencies. Like you see those symbols, those are symbols of crypto. And these are seeds. These can be used as seeds. And spring is the time to sow seeds for gardens. And spring is a, a perfect time to sow into the kingdom for souls. I planted my garden, but I got to wait till this summer to harvest it. The squash seed, I, I'm telling you, I am a, I, I know how to plant squash. A squash seed is tiny, but one seed will produce one squash plant, and that one squash plant will produce 5 to 25 pounds of squash, those yellow vegetables. That's 10 to 50 individual squash per plant. Now my first garden 50 years ago, I went to the feed and grain store in Bessemer to buy my, my seeds. And when I got to the squash, which I didn't even like squash at that time, but I knew that I needed to plant some, I saw how tiny the seed was, so I, um, I bought five pounds of it. And my buddy that ran the store, Mike Millsap, he said, uh, you got a big garden, don't you? <laughs> I said, no, it's not that big. Uh, he said, well, why are you buying so much squash seed? You don't need this much. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to plant it. I just want to have a lot of squash. I want to give it away. And he said, uh, well, Bill, he said, this is just too much. I, I, I would recommend that maybe you get a half of a pound, but not five pounds. And, and even a half a pound is too much. Just a few ounces would be fine. I said, no, I want five pounds. <laughs> so I planted the five pounds of squash seed. And needless to say, when it started coming up and started running, when the vines started running, my father-in-law, who owned that, property said, Bill, you're going to have to thin out that squash. He said, it's taken over. <laughs> I had so much squash when it started producing that I couldn't eat it all. I, Laura said, you're going to learn to love squash. <laughs> I said, I don't like squash. She said, you're going to learn to love it because you grew it and you got the harvest and we, we fried it, we stewed it, we w w ate it with dip. I mean, we ate, we ate squash in every way you could, casseroles. Now today I like it. I mean, I like squash. But I promise you I did not plant five pounds. One seed will produce a lot of squash. 
Can you imagine just one seed sown in the kingdom of what it can produce, just one seed? It can produce one to infinite numbers of souls, one seed. And so I said, Lord, I want to invest $1,000 a month in missionary evangelism. I want to. It's my heart's desire. And the Lord led me to a technology that has to do with the Internet and broadband. He just led me. He led me. I didn't know anything about this technology. And so I was earning 1% interest on my savings at the bank. 1%. Ooh, that's a lot of money, isn't it? So I took out some of that money, $2,700. I took $2,700 and, and I bought some of that technology. And that $2,700, that was the middle of December, is now worth $17,000. That $2,700 is now $17,000. And then when I got my stimulus check, I took 1000 of that $1,400 and I bought some more. And that produces around $1,000 a month. Now, isn't that amazing? That what I bought on March the 16th is providing me right at $1,000 a month. And I've been sowing it into missionary evangelism. Now, I'm going to close with this testimony. When I say what's just happened, I'm just praising the Lord that he showed me and guided me how, how to do this because I, I wouldn't have known. All I had was the desire to do it. And I promised the Lord, if you'll provide it, I'll get it. So I live on my Social Security and my pension. That's what I live on. That's, that's what I buy groceries with, pay the utilities with. But this was above that. Now here's the testimony. Many years ago, Laura and I had just given our hearts to the Lord. We were watching Billy Graham on television. I was still in the Army. We were at Fort Knox, Kentucky. We knelt down by the couch and we were converted. We, were, we got saved. By our, we were alone, the two of us. We both gave our hearts to the Lord. About a year later, we were in our home church and we had a missionary to come. She worked for World Gospel Missions. Her name was Linda Green. And she shared her vision, her ministry, and she was looking for people who wanted to partner with her ministry. And to be a partner with her was $5 a month. At that time, I made $400 a month. That was my income. That's not very much money, was it? But that's, that, was, that was pretty good back in those days. And so we said, we'd like to be a partner with you. So we started giving $5 a month, and we did that every month faithfully. $5 a month, $5 a month, $5 a month. We did it for years until she was no longer a mission on the mission field. And she wrote us and said, I want you... I, I, I let you go from that commitment, that promise, because uh, the Lord has provided a new thing for me to do. And so we didn't send that anymore, but we found somebody else to give to. When I became an evangelist, I, I, I needed partners. I won't go into detail, but uh, I just needed partners. Let's just put it that way. Because an evangelist among the Methodists will starve. 
unless the Lord provides. My bishop at that time was right. He said, you will starve to death because Methodists are not generous. And I hate to see you suffer because he said, you're a good pastor. I just don't want you to suffer. He said, you'll be on your own. But I had some partners and I had some congregations that partnered with me. And the honorariums, when I'd go to preach, many times they would be $50 for four or five days. That's all it'd be. But the Lord was good. And we got down to $37 in our checking account. And I had a mortgage. And I said, well, I can't make the mortgage payment with $37. And so I knew what the Lord wanted me to do. He said, sow it. So I sowed it as a seed in another evangelist's life and ministry. I knew a guy that was doing the very same thing I was doing, and I sent him that check for $37. He called me three days later and said, you'll never know what that check meant to me. I said, you'll never know what it meant to me either. (laughs) Because I didn't have anything after that. (laughs) But I didn't tell him that. A week later, I started getting letters (laughs) in the mail with checks. Letters in the mail. Ed Dufresne used to talk about letters in the mail, surprises in the mail. My honorarium started increasing. And from that time on, our annual income as an evangelist averaged $72,000 a year. And I didn't even make that when I was a pastor. I mean, it was so much greater. And I knew that the bishop wanted to know how much money was coming in, and I wouldn't tell him. (laughs) Because he told me I was going to starve to death. And he was just being honest. He didn't want me to suffer. So after I had done that for four years, he asked me to be a pastor again. And I said, I will. I felt the time was right. And I said, I'm going to tell you something that I never told you. I said, would you like to know (laughs) how much I averaged each year? He said, yes, I would really like to know. And I told him that amount. He said, that had to be God. I said, you're right. It had to be God. Now remember this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows generously that blessings may come to others will also reap generously and be blessed. God provides seed to sowers. And if you'll provide, if you, if you will plant and invest what God gives you, in the kingdom of heaven, in the lives of souls, that is where your treasure is. I mean, I can't wait to get to heaven to meet the people who came to the Lord through our giving, through our giving, not just what I give. I mean, I'm investing in souls. That's treasure. That's where my heart is. And I'm going to end up going there because that's where my heart is. And when the church burns with that kind of desire, we'll see that billion come to the Lord quickly. (laughs) Heaven will be filled to overflowing. Jesus will return for his people, for his body. Oh my goodness, we're in the great awakening. Just 
If you want to start sowing more than you've ever sowed into missions and evangelism, but especially missions, and if that's your heart's desire, I want to pray for you right now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for everyone in this congregation and those that are watching and listening by way of media. I pray that you will provide seed for them to sow. Oh Lord, show them a way that they would have never thought of. Give them an idea. Give them unexpected resources. Lord, their heart desires to sow into people, into souls, and you said that you would answer those who had your heart's desire. This is what you want. And so we ask in Jesus' name that you will reveal to each one who wants to be able to do more for souls that you will provide that resource and we believe in the name of Jesus it shall be so. Amen in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for listening. We, we, we're going we're gonna to see something big. I mean, it's big already, but it's going to get bigger. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate y'all.